Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Healthy Heart Show. And today it is my honor and privilege to interview Dr. Thomas O'Brien. If you do not know Dr. O'Brien, I don't know where you've been. You're certainly not in the health space because he is all over the place with incredible information. And my first exposure really to you, uh, uh, Dr. Tom, is uh, from the Gluten Summit. And the Gluten Summit was such an extraordinary event. But do me a favor, do my audience a favor, give us a little bit of your background and then advance to the Gluten Summit and then we'll go from there. You bet. Uh, my good friend, JJ Virgin, who is kind of the matriarch of online health education nowadays, you know, she helps all of us understand the dynamics of how to carry a message out. We've been friends for, oh, 15 years, I guess. And she always used to call me and say, you have to come to this seminar I'm going to. And I said, what's it about? That's about online. Ad. No, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. And, uh, and then she called and she said, well, all right, that sounds kind of, how much is it? $10,000 $10, for a weekend? Are you kidding me? I'm not doing that. No. And then one day I decided to go. She was hosting an event, so I wanted to support her. So I went. That was in January of 2013. And I was, my jaw dropped to hear how the attendees at this event, how they were reaching so many people um, just by carrying their message out online in one format or another. And I raised my hand that week and I said, I'm sorry, but I just have to ask this question. Um, what's, what's an affiliate that I really didn't know anything about this world of how to ask your friends to help you carry a message out? And, but that weekend, I made a declaration. I said, all right, I'm going to interview the world leaders. The, I mean, the guys in the world, because I've read their research. I know, I know all these guys by their writings. I don't know them in person, but I'm going to interview them. I'm going to go around the world and interview them, and I'm going to carry this message out, and I'm going to put on a summit, and it's going to be online. Will you guys help me and help carry the message out to all of your spheres of influence? And they all said they would, and 11 months later, we launched the Gluten Summit, which was the first health summit of its type in the, in the world, as far as I know. And uh, uh, it was really quite remarkable. We had 118,000 people attend, and uh, uh, the accolades and the, the 18, there were 18,000, that's how I can remember, 118 and then 18,000 18, plus uh, comments on Facebook to us. Thank you so much. You know, you saved my daughter's life, all of that type of thing. And that really got me into this world. The first guy I interviewed, the very first guy for the Gluten Summit, I went right to the top. I went to Oxford, England, and interviewed Professor Michael Marsh. Now, if you're a gastroenterologist, you know that when you're looking for celiac disease, you put a tube down the throat, down into the stomach, into the small intestine. You snip out a little piece of the intestine, tiny little bit, look at it under microscope, and that's how you diagnose celiac disease. So the guys that are looking under the microscope, the pathologists, the classification is Marsh 1, Marsh 2, Marsh 3. This was Marsh. This was the godfather of all of it. He had never been interviewed, 75 years old, <laughs> never been interviewed. And so, and he took me by the arm, walking me around Oxford. And he said, Tom, right over there is where I stood and I received my medical degree in 1962. <laughs> oh, that's fabulous, Professor. That's really fabulous. And when you hear him talk about the dangers of a sensitivity to wheat without celiac disease, it just stops you in your tracks. And we interviewed so many world leaders for the Gluten Summit, and that got me into that world. And I realized that we could really reach a lot of people and carry this message out and for a paradigm shift, a real paradigm shift. So people just start thinking differently. Why, why gluten though? I mean, so you're sitting there and you're at JJ Virgin's event. And for those of you that are not familiar with this, this is an event called Mindshare. And it's really just some of the best online uh, health uh, care promoters to get the message out there to the world. Uh, they're, uh, they're recovering medical doctors like me. They're natural born healers like Dr. O'Brien. Um, but uh, so, so at this event, 2013, and you're like uh, you're formulating this idea of the summit. Why gluten? I had started uh, back in 2004 speaking on stage about the dangers uh, of wheat, and that talk is called the conundrum of gluten sensitivity, because most 
um, practitioners believe that if you didn't have celiac disease, there was no problem with wheat. But the studies were starting to come out, and now it's very, very clear. I mean, there's no argument anymore that, I mean, Harvard's published a couple of studies on this, that every human gets intestinal permeability, or the slang term is the leaky gut, every time they eat wheat. Within five minutes of it getting into the small intestine, they've got intestinal permeability. Now, I've got the videos from Harvard. They're so cool because you see it happening in real time. You wow. see what happens when it gets down there. Now, Mrs. Patient, you have an entire new body every seven years. Every cell in your body regenerates, every cell. Some cells are very quick, the fastest growing cells, the inside lining of the gut, every three to five days you have a new lining to your gut. Some cells are very slow, like bone cells or brain cells, but they do regenerate. So you have toast for breakfast, wheat, you tear the lining of the gut, but it heals. You have a sandwich for lunch, you tear the lining of the gut, but it heals. You have pasta for dinner, you tear the lining of the gut, but it heals. Day after week after month after year after year until one day, you don't heal anymore. And that's called loss of oral tolerance. Oral meaning eating. Loss of tolerance. You don't heal anymore when you eat wheat and you tear the lining just like you do every other time, but now it doesn't heal. Now you get pathogenic intestinal permeability, the leaky gut, and that's the gateway into the development of autoimmune diseases. And my first book that came out two years ago called The Autoimmune Fix outlines that in detail. That book won the National Book Award. It's such a good book because it just outlines this whole mechanism for autoimmune disease. Now, what's, what's relevant to today's talk is that most people don't know the number one cause of death in this world today is cardiovascular disease, but atherosclerosis, the plugging up your pipes, is an autoimmune mechanism. That's what causes the pipes to plug up. So if the question is, What's the number one mechanism in getting sick and dying in the world today? It's your immune system trying to protect you from something, the autoimmune mechanism. So the question is, what's it trying to protect you from? And when you read the autoimmune fix, it becomes very clear. The step by step, I just walk you through how this occurs. And here's a study on this, and here's a study on that. And here, there's over 300 studies in that book. And so that people get the big picture and they understand cardiovascular disease, it's an immune response to something. So what is it trying to respond to? What, Mrs. Patient, your immune system is the armed forces in your body. It's there to protect you. There's an army, an air force, a Marines, a Coast Guard, a Navy. We call it IGA, IgG, IgE, IgM. They're different branches of the armed forces. What's it trying to protect you from is the million dollar question. And when you start thinking that way and you start investigating, you find out what your immune system is trying to protect you from. And for so many people, wheat is a primary concern. You know, I mean, and, and you just you put it so eloquently there in all of it. And when I give my lectures and I'm talking to people and I tell them this information that cardiovascular disease is autoimmune, I say, you know how many people understand this? You know how many cardiologists understand this? Right. <laughs> like, like, I mean, like one, um, you know, and the leader on, on this as well and the way you outline in the autoimmune fix really just kind of just step by step as to how, you know, I mean, once again, the body's not making mistakes. It's just responding to its environment. And when you have that leaky gut, it leads to leaky heart. And when my wife first mentioned the idea of leaky gut syndrome to me back in 2005, I like laughed in her face. I said, where did you, I went through 10 years of medical training. Where did you get this bogus diagnosis? And she said, that's your problem that you don't understand it. Uh, go read about it. I like this but, woman. I no, like no, For sure. Oh, believe me. And uh, I went to go read on it and there's not much in the, in the literature at the time, as you know, um, I went to go speak to holistic health providers like yourself and what you all said certainly made sense. But over the last 10 years, as you say, the medical literature has exploded on the idea of, of leaky gut. Uh, leaky gut and gluten sensitivity, the ability to test for it. Now, companies, uh, and we'll go into that further as we go uh, along. But, you know, the, the 
understanding of getting this out there is so, so important and so critical and so basic and fundamental in nature uh, to it. Now, a lot of people will say, well, is it, is it the wheat that people are eating? Uh, because when I go to Europe, I don't feel as bad as I do if I eat wheat and gluten here in the United States. Is it, 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 what's the difference about the wheat? Is it the glyphosate? Is it the poisonings? Or is it just, you know what, you were on vacation, you were in a better mental state uh, and therefore didn't seem to suffer the consequences? Yeah, that's a really good question. And uh, um, Mrs. Patient, the proteins of wheat are like a pearl necklace. When you eat wheat, hydrochloric acid made in your stomach undoes the clasp of the pearl necklace. Now you have a string of pearls. The enzymes that are made by your pancreas and your gallbladder and the microbiota in your gut, the good bacteria in your gut, these enzymes act as scissors to cut the pearl necklace into smaller clumps of the pearl neck. Snip, 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 until you get all the way down to each pearl of the pearl necklace. That's called an amino acid. Now, your intestines are a tube from the mouth to the other end, just one big long tube. If you think of a donut, if you could stretch a donut out, one big long donut, and you look down the donut, that's your, that's your intestines. So when you swallow food, it's inside the tube. It's not in your body yet. It's got to go through the walls of the tube to get into the bloodstream. But the inside of the tube is lined with cheesecloth. So only really small molecules can get through. That's why proteins have to be snip, 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 so that each pearl can go right through the cheesecloth. The problem with wheat is that no one, no human, has the scissors to break wheat proteins down into each pearl of the pearl necklace. The best we can do is clumps of the pearl necklace. Those are called peptides. And those peptides are inflammatory. They cause inflammation, which is what tears the cheesecloth, and it gives you the leaky gut, right? It tears the cheesecloth. So there are many different clumps of the pearl necklace or peptides that your body can fight, can respond to. We now know that the symptoms of gut problems when you eat wheat, whether it's bloating or gas or constipation or diarrhea, those kinds of gut symptoms, those are the lucky people, by the way, because when they eat something, they feel it. And so they know that that caused it. What I ate caused what I'm feeling. The unlucky ones are the ones that don't get gut symptoms. And the ratio is eight to one. For every one person with gut symptoms, there are eight that have symptoms somewhere else from a problem with wheat. Could be your brain, could be your gallbladder, your joints, your eyes, your ear, ears, ringing in the ears. It could be any system of your body. Eight to one is the ratio. But those that get the gut symptoms, the lucky ones, they notice when they go to Europe, they don't get any gut symptoms when they eat the wheat there. Why is that? Because the clump of the pearl necklace from wheat that causes the gut symptoms that the armed forces get activated to fight, that clump is called FODMAPs. That's a particular component in wheat and many other foods. So it's the FODMAP component of wheat that causes the majority of gut symptoms, not the gluten proteins or the other clumps of the pearl necklace. The other clumps of the pearl necklace, the gluten proteins and there are many others, they cause they cause what the Italians call lack of well-being, meaning you feel terrible. It might be your gallbladder, might be your spleen, might be your joints, might be your skin. It's a lack of well-being. But the GI symptoms are the symptoms that we've always associated with what we eat. FODMAPs cause the GI symptoms in wheat. Now, the wheat in Europe is much lower in FODMAPs, much Why? lower. Why? Why? That's, that's the strain of wheat that they use over there. Wow. That is, it's, it's the commercialized hybrid forms that we use here that are higher in FODMAPs because it causes more elasticity, more, more uh, uh, the bread sticks together so it can rise higher and be lighter because it sticks together. So it's the FODMAPs. But you still if you if your sensitivity is to your skin or to your joints, you still have the antibodies to your joints.
that get produced when you eat wheat in Europe. You just don't feel it, but you've got the antibodies to your joints or the antibodies to your heart or the antibodies to your brain, and, but you, you just don't feel it. So when people are saying, I'm, I'm going to Europe and I can eat the wheat there, I say, well, no, you can't. They say, well, but no, I, I feel okay. When I, okay, let's do this test. We checked you with the wheat zoomer a year ago and you had lots of problems. You've been really good. You cleaned it up. We rechecked you seven months later or eight months later. Now all those antibodies to wheat are gone, so we know you're in good shape. Now, if you're going to go to Europe and you're going to eat the wheat over there because you don't feel bad when you eat it, when you come back, we're going to do another blood test to see have the antibodies to wheat gone back up again, even though you feel fine when you eat it over there. And I've only had about six, seven patients that have done that, but every single one of them, the, the antibodies went right back up again. Yeah. Every single one of them. You know, I mean, it, it, I mean, for those of you that are watching this, and this is absolutely brilliant, brilliant stuff from Dr. Uh, Thomas O'Brien, uh, you know, did the gluten summit and the autoimmune fix, and he's got uh, a new book that's out that he'll tell us about in a few, but, uh, you know, when I went back and started looking in the medical literature for uh, intestinal permeability or this concept of leaky gut, you know, things start, you know, uh, uh, trickling into the literature, certainly over the last five years. But even back in 2007, there's an article in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, the biggest cardiology journal in the world. And in there, it talks about intestinal hyperpermeability and heart failure. But I can only tell you, of course, and you know this, is that the average cardiologist would never even bother reading that. I know I didn't read it in 2007. It had no interest to me back then, but it's so fundamental to, to what we're talking about. And you made reference to, to the wheat zoomer and uh, you know the wheat zoomer by Vibrant America, Vibrant Wellness. It's a very interesting I think it's, it's, you know, <clears throat> we all have experienced this, uh, you know, being the freak at the table, if you will. You go to the restaurant, you tell them that you're gluten-free, and they, get, they roll the eyes like, oh, another gluten-free, you know, bandwagon, you know, jumper, the latest, you know, fad, you know, diet. Yet, we've got the evidence now in, you know, in the ability to show people, hey, listen, smart guy, uh, I've got a certificate here that says that I'm sensitive to... Uh, wheat and the components of wheat, including uh, gluten, etc. And I've got leaky gut, so do me a favor. Don't put any gluten on my freaking plate. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Uh, I'm in the process now of writing a chapter for a new uh, textbook in cardiology that's coming out by uh, Dr. Mark Houston. And uh, he's a great cardiologist and uh, vascular biologist. That means the health of the blood vessels. And uh, so my chapter is on food-related disorders, especially wheat and cardiovascular incidents and everything from cardiomyopathy, uh, to, which is a swelling of your heart and the muscle gets really weak, to uh, congestive heart failure, to increased homocysteine levels. Uh, that's called the silent killer. That's what killed my dad. Uh, so gluten sensitivities often will cause elevated homocysteine levels because if you think about uh, we all know, uh, as docs, we know if there's a homocysteine problem, you give them the B6, uh, B12, folic acid, trimethylglycine, the B vitamins, and a couple other things, and you bring that homocysteine right down to normal, and everybody's safe. Uh, but docs don't check for it, and so they don't look for it. Well, if you have a sensitivity to wheat, the B vitamins are absorbed in the first part of the small intestine called the proximal part of the small intestine. And that's exactly where the inflammation occurs and exactly where the intestinal permeability begins when you eat wheat. So when you have that inflammation in that part of the intestines that absorbs the B vitamins, you don't absorb B vitamins. And if you don't absorb B vitamins, you get higher levels of homocysteine. And if you get higher levels of homocysteine, it causes unexplained miscarriages and strokes and heart attacks. Just Google homocysteine and miscarriages, and here come all the studies. I published a paper on that uh, in 2012, I think it was, maybe 2011, um, in uh, practical gastroenterology on uh, uh, B vitamins and unexplained miscarriages. Uh, and it easily could be because of a sensitivity to wheat. That could be the trigger causing the inflammation in the gut where those vitamins are usually absorbed, so you don't absorb them, 
to get elevated homocysteine levels and all the problems that that can cause. Oh yeah, no, I, and you know, and you mentioned obviously when cardiovascular uh, health and wellness. Another thing that obviously I get people from all over the world that come to see me, and that's for heart rhythm issues, including atrial fibrillation. Well, part of the leaky gut diagnosis and the intestinal hyperpermeability is the anti-actin antibodies. And actin is that tiny little protein found in all muscle tissue, the smooth muscle tissue of the gut, the smooth muscle tissue of the arteries, and of course of the heart muscle itself. So it stands to reason that if you are attacking, if your body is attacking in an autoimmune fashion, the atria, then you have atrial fibrillation. And once again, you and I know that, Dr. Tom, but how many cardiologists either, they obviously, they don't know it. And if they're listening to this, they don't care. They you know, just don't care. I just uh, uh, typed in on PubMed, uh, as you were speaking, atrial fibrillation and celiac disease. There's 14 studies on it, 14 studies. And you know, so you just check. Um, wheat is one of the most common undiagnosed food sensitivities. Look, every disease, as far as we know, every degenerative disease is a disease of inflammation. At the cellular level, the cell's always on fire. The question is, is it a heart cell or a brain cell? Is it gasoline or kerosene? But you want an anti-inflammatory lifestyle. And wheat is inflammatory for everyone. It's just a question of if you've crossed that threshold yet, that loss of oral tolerance. That can happen when you're two years old, 22 years old, 92 years old. Whenever you cross that oral tolerance level, now the problems begin. And I think you made a great point earlier on too, is that the people that sometimes have the symptoms to wheat, they're the lucky ones. The lucky ones. Because we've seen patients over the years, we both have, and like, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, Mrs. Smith. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, you know, you got to give up the gluten. And she's like, "Why? I don't have a problem with gluten." Right. And I say, "But you've had a heart attack. Maybe it was from the gluten." Oh, you know. So now they yeah. get it. And I mean, certainly, you and I are not going to wish you know celiac on anybody. As far as like, hey, let's you know, you know it's a good thing you had celiac uh, because now you know for the future because that can be difficult to overcome. Although I'm sure you know, in in your skilled hands, obviously becomes a lot easier. Well, the danger the danger is more in non celiac wheat sensitivity. That's the real danger that people don't know and docs don't check for it. But now we have a tool the test that you referred to earlier, and I did, the wheat zoomer, which has a 97 to 99% sensitivity and a 98 to 100% specificity. That means every time it's right on the money. And there's never been a laboratory test like that ever in any area of medicine. But, you know, just like, just like it would take a room 20 by 20 room full of computers 25 years ago to do what my iPhone can do now. It, it's all done here. The same is true with laboratory technology. And our laboratories are just not keeping up with the latest cutting edge technology. Vibrant is. And mm -hmm. so now, and this is published by Mayo Clinic. They published the article on this. They gave those statistics as to the sensitivity and specificity. This is from Joe Murray and his team at Mayo, and he's one of the godfathers of celiac. And um, there are four guys, I call them the four horsemen in celiac disease, that for the last 20 years they've been doing so much to carry the message out. It's more than just a gut problem. It's more. And there's um, Peter Green at Columbia, uh, Alessio Fasano at Harvard, Stefano Guandolini at University of Chicago, he's retired now, and Joe Murray at Mayo. And Joe Murray is the one that wears horn rim glasses, bow ties, leather patches on the elbows of his sport coat, and has no uh, pharmaceutical affiliations whatsoever. He's the geek of geeks, and just purest of intent to help humanity. They, they all are, of course, but Murray is baseless with any outside interest. His team published about this new, he said, it's a new era in laboratory medicine. 
It's like, wake up, everyone, wake up to this. Uh, but as, as you know, Dr. Jack, um, the average now, and this was published three years ago, the average from when translational research, meaning research that changes the way we think, when it's first published, and when the doc down the street is using that research, the average is 17 years. Hmm. 17 years, not the extreme, that's the average. So, What uh, percentage of people would you say are sensitive to gluten? Is, I mean, from what, you're, from what you're saying right now, and, and, I, and I don't disagree with you, I would agree with you, that pretty much everybody, either they're sensitive to gluten and its components, uh, and wheat certainly, uh, now or they're going to be like nobody's escaping this lifetime, uh, you know, without without uh, you know having having an issue with uh, you know the gluten proteins, uh, you know, on and on. Yeah, the uh, that's it's a good question. So it's it's a balance. You know, it's like a teeter totter. And how many anti-inflammatory things are you doing, like eating berries and other um, having quiet time every day, going for walks or whatever your thing is. And how many inflammatory things are you doing, like eating French fries and not getting enough sleep or whatever it should be? Um, there's a whole world of factors that come into play as to when do you lose oral tolerance? And that's what you're asking me. When do you lose oral tolerance? When you lose oral tolerance, that's when your immune system says, whoa, we need to protect you here. And now we have a test that is that accurate, 97 to 100% accurate, to tell you when you've lost oral tolerance. And so, uh, and clinically in our practice, we'll see maybe two people out of 15 that come back normal with yeah. no problems. It's that common. It's because there are so many toxins, so many insults that our bodies are dealing with now on a daily basis every single day. You know, the Journal of Pediatrics published a paper, and I talk about this a lot in the autoimmune fix, that it's 250 pounds of toxic chemicals per person per day that are being dumped in the U.S. 250 pounds. That means for you and I, Dr. Jack, that's 500 pounds, 10 50-pound bags yeah. every single day, every single day. And then it's no wonder that when they check the blood of newborn babies in the United States, the average is over 180 toxic chemicals in their bloodstream at birth that aren't supposed to be there. And many of them are nerve or brain toxins. And I believe that's a tremendous contributor to the increase in autism that we're getting. That vaccinations don't cause autism. And I tell every doc I meet on stage, don't ever say vaccinations cause autism. You sound like a nutcase. Vaccinations may cause autism. That's very true, and there's lots of science for that. But you can't say they do cause autism, or else every person that gets a vaccination would be on the autism spectrum, every single person. So maybe, they are. <laughs> maybe they are, Dr. Tom. Um, maybe, they are, are, maybe they are. I, I've got young kids, and I see who, who goes to some of these schools, and I see some of the kids that... Uh, are, are on the playground. I'm can, I think they all are on the spectrum uh, at, at this point. Um, well, I think, um, I think uh, uh, there's a lot of validity to that in terms of with all the toxic chemicals these kids are being exposed to in their brains. And, but it, it's the accumulation of all of it. You know, there was a study um, came out a couple of years ago in from Norway or Denmark. I'm sorry, I don't remember which country. Government commission. Should we recommend women not breastfeed in a first pregnancy? Hmm. Should we recommend? And it was three years. It was supposed to be wow. a six-month study. They went almost three years before they came out with their conclusions. Why? Well, because uh, people over there eat a lot of fish. The fish come from the fjords that are long and narrow and deep, but the farmers have been using PCBs, DDT, insecticides, pesticides, on their crops, and the rain washes all that stuff down into the fjords, but they're narrow, so they're, they accumulate. The fish are full of PCBs. There's no evidence anywhere that the amount of PCBs in a fish that you eat is a problem. There's no evidence of that. But 25 years of accumulating little bits of PCB every 
two days when you eat fish or every three days if you eat fish every three days. That little bit of PCB that your body can't break down, it accumulates. And where does it accumulate? It, they're called endocrine disrupting chemicals because they affect your hormones. They accumulate in your hormone loving cells like your breasts. And so 28 year old women, first pregnancy, healthy pregnancy, feeling great, newly married, you know, first baby, healthy delivery. Now her brain says, okay, let's make some milk here. So the lactation process begins in the breast and where do the breasts get the fuel to make milk? It's the fat cells of the breast. And the fat cells are loaded with 28 years of PCBs. So it, the mother's breast milk is highly toxic to the baby. Only in the first pregnancy, because after that, they're detoxed. They're so detoxed. the other pregnancies are fine, right? But it's that accumulation of 20, 25, 28 years of minor amounts. So what do you do? Well, the government commission came out and said, well, we think it's more important to breastfeed than not. And I personally agree with that. But my position is every woman of childbearing age needs to be told about this and they need to detox their breasts before they get pregnant. And it takes about six months to do that, six months to a year. Very easy, very simple thing. You just stay consistent and you flush out this crud that's accumulated in your body over the years. If not, your baby's brain is at high risk. You know, I just sat, I just sat on the plane yesterday flying back home uh, with a young woman, maybe 30 or so, and she's an attorney, and um, she has a, a 12-month-old baby, and I started talking about the study, and her eyes just about popped out of her head, and I, and I said, but you just detox. You, now, you've already gone through this, you know, so it's not as much. So you're, well, what do I do for my baby? That's what she wanted to know. What do I do for my baby? And so we've talked about brain foods and told her about my book that just came out, You Can Fix Your Brain. And so read the book and you'll see there's a whole protocol here to supply the nutrients to build healthy brain cells. And that's what you want to focus on for your baby. That's one thing you want to focus on is making sure that baby's environment internally is encouraging the strongest, most expressive brain cells possible. Yeah, most certainly. It's 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 certainly a, a sad situation. You know, we we saw a patient, my wife and I together saw a uh, an, uh, two uh, young Indian boys. And Indian people are known to have the worst coronary artery disease in the world. But they were just children, and uh, seven year old, nine year old, and the nine year old was on the was on the autism spectrum, and the seven year old not so much. Yet the seven year old had some evidence of eczema and some pitting of the fingernails, so some autoimmune type phenomena going on. So we ran the wheat zoomer looking for leaky gut on both of those young boys. Well, they both lit up like the Christmas tree, you know, because the colors on the vibrant America are the, uh, you know, red, yellow, green, and just a lot of, ye uh, you know, a lot of reds on there. And what we told them, you know, of course, you know, that, you know, there's evidence of leaky gut, there's gluten sensitivity in all these different areas and antibodies that, that we're testing. And is that your seven and nine year old, we're going to help with their brain by, you know, by fixing the leaky gut and getting them off gluten. We're going to help with these autoimmune issues. But what we're going to do, what really got me jazzed up was to say, we're going to, if you follow the program here, we're going to prevent your children from dying of a heart attack in 30 years. Yeah. And that was pretty powerful stuff. You bet. You bet. And that's exactly right. And it's great that you kind of package the ideas that way for the, the parents. You know, because you know, most people aren't um, trained in how to think about this kind of stuff. And so we've got to tell them what the positives are. You know, we, we have to tell them that we're going to prevent this in the future. And your child's brain's going to work a lot better. They're going to be healthier. We're going to stop all this stuff or we're going to slow it down. We're going to do the best that we can. But they're not going to have heart attacks when they're 30, 35 years old. Exciting stuff. You know, I often tell the story. I got, you know, listen, my, my wife was the reason for me converting and opening up my eyes to uh, holistic health and, and true health care as opposed to the sick care model where I came from. My father dying of a Parkinson's-like illness, and it was certainly multifactorial. And do I think my father had leaky gut, uh, a leaky brain? No doubt. No doubt. Uh, Absolutely. No doubt. No doubt.
No doubt. All right. So, so your new book, uh, of course, is just Runaway Amazon bestseller. Um, uh, New York Times, uh, you hit bestseller? Not yet. Not, Not yet. Right? Hoping for that. Hoping okay. for that. Well, anyone who's listening to this podcast, of course, go out and get Dr. Tom's new book. You can fix uh, your brain. Uh, I got an advanced uh, you know, copy on it, and it is absolutely outstanding. It is 400 plus pages of information. How many references you got in there to prove what you're saying? I, I, I think it's 380, somewhere around there. Don't, don't you love when people kind of take uh, you know, shots at us? Like, oh, yeah, that's just a fad, or oh, that's just uh, some crazy doctors you know, talking. It's like if you're insulting Dr. Tom O'Brien and his new book, you're insulting the PhDs that he just talked about at Cambridge and, and all the, you know, Columbia and all these high-tech institutions, uh, you know, people that are like borderline Nobel Prize winners in medicine, you're like, you're insulting those people by insulting us. And in, in, in my book, I've got 300 references. Oh, Wolfson was a great cardiologist until he met his chiropractic wife and he went off the deep end. Uh, yes, if you're exactly. insulting me and you're insulting my wife, you're insulting the 300 authors of those MDs, those PhDs, those brilliant people who wrote the original literature. Tell me, tell me, tell me why people should go out and get, uh, get the new book, uh, You Can Fix Your Brain. Well, if you go to our website, which is thedr.com, the, the doctor.com, just don't spell the word doctor out, uh, and you click there, it'll take you to Amazon or Books A Million or wherever you want to go. There's five or six different options, but then there's a bunch of downloads that you get. You know, we send you a bunch of stuff that helps. You know, I'll give you an example. We talk in great detail in the book about this, and we've got this test available. It's a sniff test, and you, it's like a, like a lottery card. You know, you scratch it to see if you, so here you scratch it and you go, Oh, that smells like strawberry in you. Oh, it is strawberry. Good. And the next one, oh, that smells like uh, leather. Oh, it is leather. Good. And it's a 12-cent scratch test. If you score eight or less correct, you got a problem. And wow. it's, a, it's a huge problem. And it has nothing to do with your nose because the nerves of scent go right back and right on top of your memory cells, right on top. And why is that? Well, our ancestors, this is the way we're built. You're walking down the trail and all of a sudden you smell saber-toothed tiger. You've got to have an immediate response to know what that faint scent is and get out of there really quick, right? That's why the scent nerves are right on top of the memory nerves. Right. So if you can't smell, if you're losing your sense of smell, and we give you the studies also that um, if you're over 70 and you're losing your sense of smell, your risk of, it's a, it's a very accurate predictor of much higher risk of mortality within five years of something. It doesn't matter, of something. You're going to die unless you turn around the inflammation that's going on in your brain. If you're younger than 70, You've got a brain deterioration mechanism going on right now, and you may feel fine. You know, I'm fine. I'm just fine. But if you're losing your sense of smell, you got a problem, and it's an early biomarker. It's an early indicator. It's so cool. I'm so proud to have this available for people. So no so, brainer. So, so this is on the website, uh, and you said uh, the doctor.com, and doctor, of course, is abbreviated, so people can get that kit, they order that kit, you send them the kit, they take the test at home, see where they're at, they freak out, and then they come back to you looking for more information because they, they're right, they realize freak they're out, in trouble. They freak out, and then they go back to their doctor, like, go back to Dr. Wolfson and say, hey, I did that smell test, and I, I didn't do very good, what's next? And then the next thing is the neural zoomer. So you look to see how much inflammation is going on. What are the biomarkers of inflammation in the brain? And then you do the deep dive into functional medicine. Where's the inflammation coming from? Is it gasoline or kerosene? We, we know it's the brain that's, that's suffering. And so then you start to do the investigation. You figure out, is it food? Is it uh, aluminum? Is it mercury? Is it mold in the house? Where's it coming from? And so you do the deep dive. But you, you never know to do the deep dive unless you do the smell test and say, wow. I got a problem here. I feel fine, but I've got, this is an early marker of a brain deterioration problem. This book, I'm, I'm so proud of this book. 
And that's why it's number one in seven categories on Amazon is because it's like, what, what, you know, when, when you read this book and also I did the audio on it, that, that was the hardest thing I've ever done. <laughs> it really was because for four days, I'm eight glad hours. You did it. I'm glad you did it because I know, I, you know, people, when I, when I was asked to do the audio for mine, I didn't. I, I wish I did. Honestly, it was a mistake. I should have done it, uh, you know, for mine. But I can imagine how painstaking oh. that was because it's not just you sitting back in your chair like you're, you know, smoking a pipe and like telling the story. <laughs> you know, you really got to make sure you dial it in right. You know, you mentioned uh, inflammation. Obviously, all cardiologists know that inflammation is bad, but nobody asks why. Let me say one more thing, too. Um, is the book available for purchase on your website yes. directly, directly from you? So yes. I yes. do want to say this. Uh, Amazon is fantastic. They're so convenient for so many different things. But you know what? Amazon is a trillion-dollar company. They got enough money. Buy the book from Dr. Tom at thedoctor.com. That's my personal preference for you, Dr. Tom. I, I think that uh, you, you already got your Amazon bestseller status, so, so we're good with that. Now it's time for you, know, for, for you to reap uh, you know, the, the total rewards. Um, all right, what else? So, so, the, so the book is out. Give me another, give me like 30 seconds on, on what's next for Dr. Tom O'Brien on his Changing the World Health Mission. This is so brilliant. I'd love to pick your brain uh, forever off air. We talked about some other things, you know, some of the things that are problematic for leaky gut, uh, you know, why people aren't getting success. You talked about the importance of prebiotics. So if you're out there, and go to the doctor.com for information about prebiotics and the gut microbiome. That if you're not healing that leaky gut, there's a problem there. Tell me, tell me what's next. All right, I'll give you one more pearl. One more pearl. Why is it an apple a day keeps the doctor away? What's that all about? And it's very, very true. Because, and Mrs. Patient, I want you to take four or five apples, organic, of course. Um, uh, Stephanie. Yes. Hi. <laughs> Am I too early? Yeah, you're a little bit early. Let me let me have you uh, come back. <laughs> I'll come back in five. Thank Sorry. you. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's really funny. Uh, that's great. You're you're a busy man. <laughs> I, I, I'm interviewing the best. I mean, come on. I go Thank from you. you to Dr. Senoff. I mean, this is fantastic stuff. So, uh, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Tell me, tell me the real reason why. Mrs. Patient, buy four or five apples, wash them, leave the skins on them, cut the seeds. You'll know, dice them so get the seeds out of there. Put them in a pot. Add water to about a third the height of the apples. Add some cinnamon in there. If you got kids, maybe a couple of raisins. Turn it on high. In about five to eight minutes, look in the pot. If you see the skin is starting to shine, turn it off. It's done. In, in Europe, they call them stewed apples. Here we call it applesauce. But the shine on the apples means the pectin has been released from the apples and is easily accessible to the lining of the gut. The pectin is a primary fuel to significantly increase intestinal alkaline phosphatase, IAP. Intestinal alkaline phosphatase stimulates healing intestinal permeability, builds support for the probiotics, lower serum cholesterol, lower serum triglycerides, reduces metabolic endotoxemia by 75%. Uh, it's it's re remarkable what IAP does, and ap the pectin in apples increases your IAP levels. So it really is an apple a day keeps the doctor away. So brilliant, every, brilliant every stuff. Protocol, and, every yeah. protocol for intestinal permeability must include fresh applesauce. Wow. Wow. Fresh applesauce. How amazing is that? Fresh organic applesauce. Everybody, thank you so much. Dr. Thomas O'Brien. Brilliant. Check out his website, thedoctor.com. Thank you so much for being on my show, The Healthy Heart Show. We'll see you next time.